Hello everyone, on today's edition of The Final Bar, we'll do our normal Friday routine, wrapping up this week, trying to make sense of things. Had a nice distribution move into the close, but bonds, some other assets rallying okay, so we'll try to connect all the dots and see where things are at. We have a segment today on circuit breakers. We're going to look at that particular uh, area of the market structure, where you have trading halts, what they mean, how to look out for them. Also answer many of your questions from The Final Bar mailbag. So ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Hope everyone is safe, doing well today. We're going to attempt to debrief on the markets from a technical perspective. I feel like the last couple days we had a bit of normalcy, but today that sort of got flipped around on end with a nice distribution going into the last two hours of trading, the market going to a new closing low. Not quite an intraday low, it looked like, but but certainly uh, selling into a position of weakness. So what does that mean for the long-term trends and, uh, and so forth? We're going to try to make, uh, try to make sense of it. Um, you know, the last couple days, thinking of my guests the last two days, you know, we talked a lot about breadth. We talked about sector rotation and just trying to get a sense of where things are at. You know, if you're looking at the markets now with fresh eyes, what do you see? And again, what we'll, what we'll I hope to make the case for is I see a lot of signals suggesting we are beginning earlier in the process, not later in the process of, uh, of bottoming out here. Today maybe sort of gave us uh, a little more evidence along those lines. Getting to the schedule here, we've got a lot of great experts on Stock Charts TV and StockCharts.com. I hope you're taking advantage of their expertise. On this show and on Stock Charts TV, we're going to bring some great uh, voices in front of you. On Monday, Behind the Charts, our interview style show is going to fe uh, feature David Auerbach, from the Daily Repeat. We interviewed David on this show earlier this week, and we have a longer form interview we recorded with him that you're going to want to see. On Tuesday, Rob Slimer from Fundstrat. On Wednesday, Pat Ceresna. On Matt, uh, Matt Maley is going to be on Thursday, the 26th. Matt's a long-time uh, friend, institutional salesperson, does a fantastic job with the, uh, with the charts for a lot of institutions. Also on the 25th, a fantastic special event called Navigating a Bear Market, where myself and a number of my fellow contributors are going to share how we are thinking about this bear market from a lot of different angles. It is going to be a, a must watch, I think, for any of you trying to get your head around what's happening. And along those lines, let's go right to the market recap. So when I'm thinking of the S&P, again, my, my, uh, the, the charts that I show on this show are really my daily routine. And what I do in the morning is just start at the upper left and, and basically go to the right. And I add some taps here on the end every day for the show. But, you know, I start with the long-term weekly chart of the S&P, and then I go right to the daily chart of the S&P. And as I continue to look at the daily chart, I find I keep backing up a little bit just to make sure that December 18 low is still on the, on the image. It's, it's a little off there, but you can see the, low, the line 2350 is taken from that low, which was the uh, December 18 market low before we rallied into you know, the next uh, the subsequent year plus of positive trend. We've retraced that very quickly. And again, what, what I've been looking at for a while now is this 2350 level. This week was where we finally breached the level, and Wednesday of this week is when we went below it. We went below it again yesterday, but both of those days we actually closed black, back above. And, you know, support and resistance 101, in my opinion, after you define the level is to identify if we, you know, if and when there's a break. It's all about the confirmation. We break it, that's fine. We need to close through the level number one. We finally got that today with the close almost down to 2300. We closed around 2305 the S&P. Step two is what I call confirmation, which is some sort of follow through. On Monday, going into next week, do we get a follow through? Do we get a, a continuation of this uh, supply or of this uh, weakening or lessening of demand in, in the form of a lower close? That would, in my opinion, open the door to much further lows or the potential for much, uh, much further lows. Closing below 2350 was pretty significant and seeing today how it, how it happened, how we rolled over to go toward the lows, I thought was pretty interesting. Here's a chart of the last uh, five days. This is the total week on the S&P. You can see as of yesterday when we're, when we're recording the show, I commented that we really hadn't gone anywhere. Even though we'd moved around, we'd fluctuated, 
on a closing basis, we were right at Monday's open, basically, at the end of the day. I think that changed today. We're now more at the lower end of this range. Again, that low from Wednesday is going to be pretty key. We want to get below 227 on the spiders. I think that would uh, indicate uh, further weakness that we might be looking for. It was pretty homogenous, although small and mid caps were down a little bit more, but everything down uh, today. And interestingly, actually, the VIX came down as well. You'd expect with this sort of sell-off, the VIX would be elevated, but it was a little disconnected now. The VIX actually lowered down to 67, but, you know, again, still at uh, perennial highs here. These are uh, very elevated levels for the VIX by any historical measure. In terms of sector routines, you know, interesting actually on a day when uh, oil has been all over the place and overall down. Energy was actually up 1% today. Looking at the USO, USO was actually down 8%, um, but energy uh, a little bit up. Let's we'll see how you know uh, the spot prices for crude oil uh, play out, or the, the commodities uh, rather. Uh, but energy was the only of the 11 uh, S&P sectors in the green, followed by consumer discretionary and then financials. On the downside, you had some of the traditional defense, utilities, consumer staples, real estate. So those are three sectors that you, on, a, on a down day, you'd actually expect them to be up here at the top. Things like consumer discretionary, financials, you'd expect them to be at the bottom. So the sector picture has become disconnected of sorts, I think, in the last couple of days. We had these, you know, yesterday was pretty spread between uh, gainers and losers. Today, most things down, but things that led the way down were sort of the defense that you would expect to uh, be somewhat resilient in this sort of environment. So some really interesting, interesting levels. And, and to be honest with you, I, I don't think this is unusual. It's it's unusual if it was sort of a normal, plain vanilla environment. This market is anything but plain vanilla. And I think the best thing you can do is, is less make assumptions based on what should be working, but focus on the charts and what actually is happening. Looking at global ETFs, you have a number of things that are actually up pretty decently. And uh, Taiwan, South Korea, both up over 4% today. Sort of unusual. On the downside, you had Mexico, Australia. And the S&P was actually one of the worst of all the global ETFs that we look at. So the U.S. market really... Seeming to be seeming to struggle here again. Timing wise, we're sort of the last in the day. So I think as coronavirus news comes out, as things happen, as people process it, might be reflected more than anything in the U.S. markets because we're sort of the last to digest the daily news before it reboots with uh, uh, with the Asian markets uh, very soon. In terms of groups that were up and down, tires is a pretty tiny group, so I tend to just mentally skip that. I am very interested to see things like gambling hotels, recreational services. These are groups that have done very poorly. Also airlines, uh, all uh, bouncing in. The, the charts still look very, uh, fairly negative. They're, they're certainly more in a bearish phase, but a nice sort of reaction bounce. Something like the gambling and hotel groups were up, you know, eight, nine percent today. So, uh, you know, coming off of very beaten down levels. Again, the, a trend is not made of one day. It's a sequence of days over the longer term trend. I still think you know, by, by most trend following measures, the trend's still decidedly down on those. I see a number of energy groups down here as well, like EMP stocks, exploration and production pipelines. This is why the energy sector was sort of one of the, um, the better, uh, better groups. On the way down, you have things like recreational products. You know, water has actually been a theme that a lot of people have been interested in outside of what's all been happening uh, sort of macro thematically, you know, just the idea of sustainability and, and so forth. But the water group in particular has gotten uh, gotten crushed in the last couple uh, last couple of days, actually. The second half this week uh, really got beaten down on it. Also, fixed line telecoms. That's something like AT&T, Verizon, I want to say those are all in that group. So um, that getting hurt is a, sort of a bit of a head scratcher in terms of what should be working, right, in this sort of environment. So again, more more than ever, I think this is a time to be paying attention to the charts. Don't think as much about, I'm, you know, I'm looking to put risk on, so here's where I want to buy. Focus on what's actually happening. Focusing on the charts, I think, is what's going to help you uh, survive and thrive through this sort of environment. We didn't talk as much about bonds, but just to wrap up our market recap, it's worth noting the TLT was up big today. So we had this issue with stocks and bonds selling off. That changed today with stocks going down, but bonds actually rallying pretty hard, the 10-year yield going down uh, significantly as well. So certainly a move to safety in a fixed income market. That's our market recap for today. Again, I, I feel like we touch on, we scratch the surface on these things. There's so many themes to try and uh, unpack. We didn't get to a lot of individual names, but I hope as part of your weekend routine, that's sort of what I hit it on Sundays. I try to hit individual stocks a little harder and see what sort of patterns I can come up with. I hope you can do the same. Next segment is the final bar mailbag. One of the things I love about this show is answering uh, your questions, sort of uh, you know, opening up uh, to, to any uh, thoughts, suggestions, questions about the market, about the structure, about 
the environment, about uh, you know patterns, technical analysis, anything is fair game. Just shoot questions to us at the final bar at stockcharts.com. We get a lot of questions from you. We read all of them. Try to get to them as much as we uh, as we can. Question number one. I'll try to just keep the list small, but have to uh, have to get in here. A couple questions. So a segment earlier this week was. I read the article in Barron's, as, as many of you probably have, talking about stocks with big dividends, yield, dividend yields. And as stocks sold off, a lot of those dividend yields started to look more and more attractive. So here's AT&T. The dividend yield back here was probably 5 to 6%, and now it's over 7% because the price has come down so much. And if you think that's big, look at something like ExxonMobil with a, a dividend yield above 10%. And had a couple questions related to that, which, I, with a, which I'd love to address here. You know, the one uh, which was very thoughtfully done, you even include tables of some data. So thank you so much for taking the time to do that. And you're absolutely right. The question was, you know, when you look at yields on dividend paying stocks, they've jumped as a consequence of the prices dropping through the floor. You really need to look at the company's ability to continue paying the dividend in the future. Isn't that right? And, and, and the answer is you're absolutely right. So when I'm talking about some of these beaten down stocks, Exxon, Chevron, others, you're assuming for that dividend yield to remain that high, you're making two assumptions, basically. Either the price remains very muted and or the company continues to be able to pay the dividend that it's listed, right? It can, you know, in the case of ExxonMobil, you're assuming it continue to pay out three and a half dollars a share uh, you know, going forward. If oil prices are down where they are, if the stock's down where they are, if the business gets hurt really bad because of that, the ability of a company like Exxon to be able to continue to pay dividends at that level totally fair. And so usually one or two or both of those things would most likely change, right? The price will recover. And usually there's a period of time where if the price recovers, you'd assume a company could weather that okay. Uh, option two, the company lowers their dividend and that will bring the yield back to a more reasonable level. And you're absolutely right um, about those two points. It's my, you know, my point to that is you have to, you know, the assumption you're making with any of these things looking in dividend yield is that you're consuming a consistent dividend yield going forward. And that is a huge assumption. So absolutely right. Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. If you're if you're making those bets, make sure you have a good reason as to how you think or, 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 or why you think the company's going to continue to pay dividends at that level. Great question, by the way. Uh, question number two, is there any way that in the future we could sort by dividend yield? I think that's a great question. I love that. And I say it on air just to remind myself to talk to Chip and Grace and the other Others on the management team to remind them how important I think some of these things are. You know, on our charts, if you look at the bottom, some of you may not have noticed, but behind all these ways, underneath all the ways you can customize the charts, you have these links. And the simple summary page is one of the newer features that we've added on stockcharts.com. This is one of the first ways that we've really expanded our fundamental data on stockcharts.com. Traditionally, we have not had very much. We are actively trying to improve that and upgrade the ability uh, of all of you to understand companies the entire company, not just the price of the stock, but the whole whole business through stockcharts.com. And so this is step one of a multi-step effort to get more of our fundamental data in here. A lot of these items that you see on here, you, you can currently screen on, or you will very soon be able to screen on using our scanning engine. So we're able to screen on things like dividend yield and other, other things more and more over time. Also, we're looking to chart these data points over time. So we could chart things like PE, other valuation measures over time along with the price, make some analysis uh, that way. Also being able to visualize things in a tabular format, I think that'll be part of the scanning engine as well. So I am very keen on sorting by market cap and dividend yield and a number of other things. And I guarantee you it's on the list of things we are totally working on. Next question, and thanks again for all these. These were very, 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 very well done. Um, yeah, I talked about commodity ETFs. I think this was yesterday. And the one that I mentioned in particular um, I usually look at things like DBC and some of the others, GCC, the CRB index. You know, to be honest with you, when I'm showing commodities, I try to pick commodity. I mean, I'm sorry, when I show ETFs, I try to pick ETFs that I think best represent the underlying asset. So when I'm looking, looking at the USO or DBC or GLD or any of those, I'm not thinking of things like K1s or the tax implications of buying them. I'm looking at them because I think they represent the price of the asset, and more, and more importantly, the fear and greed underlying the movements in price. So I'm trying to look for liquid ETFs that I think are highly traded, heavily traded, and can represent where the supply and demand, where the fear and greed are moving to. Um, so the question was in particular, what about the K1 on something like DBC? Should we be looking at things that don't have a Q, K, K1? And again, if you're not familiar with it, that's some uh, uh, part of your tax filing. You'd have to 
uh, with certain partnership type of uh, structures, you have to uh, file a, you get a K-1 as part of your uh, tax preparation. It could be a bit annoying. I've, uh, I've gone through that for sure. The PDBC is actually a particular ETF that does not have a K-1. So um, you're absolutely right. And my, my qualification to any of the ETFs I show you is don't just look at the ETF um, because of that, uh, because of the uh, because of the fact that I'm showing you always make a better assessment for what an ETF would mean for your own personal process. And I think something like a K-1, whether or not something pays that uh, or, or requires that should be part of your process. My last question is on Pring's Bottom Fisher Index, which is uh, exclamation point PRB fish. And listen, one of the things I love about doing the show is some of you have asked questions about things I really don't know a lot about. I didn't know this was on the platform and I was thrilled to learn it. So I'll tell you what I learned. And thanks so much for the question. Uh, Martin Pring, who we are, are thrilled to have as one of our featured contributors, has created a number of indicators. The KST, or the No Shirt Thing Indicator, is one that I've used at times. And if you look at Martin Pring's blog, you'll see it in the show. You'll see he uses it fairly often. We have an indicator called the Pring Bottom Fisher, which basically rolls up the KST readings, those uh, momentum readings on a bunch of stocks in the Dow, and actually smooths that out. So it's actually showing you um, it's trying to identify when the Dow members are starting to turn higher. So one of the charts that I've actually added to my list, which I'd encourage you to look at as the same, is the S&P 500. At the bottom, I have the PRB fish, which is the um, uh, that no sure thing indicator, the Pring's bottom fisher indicator. And then I did a 10-day moving average of that, which is here in blue. And I'm looking at when they cross up and down through one another. When the market is down, when this indicator is low, and when it breaks up through the moving average, that's sort of the quote unquote buy signal from the Pring Bottom Fisher Index. If you're not familiar with it, and I was not, in our chart school uh, thing, if you just search for Pring's Bottom Fisher, you'll get to this article, explains how it's calculated, how to use it, and it breaks down some of the, uh, and a little further on uh, some of the things that I just mentioned here. So thanks so much for that. I'm actually going to include it as part of my uh, market analysis. Hope to keep on top of it in the coming uh, days and weeks. So thanks so much for those questions, folks on our mailbag. We are going to go to our next segment. Our producer, Gretchen, did a fantastic job helping us understand circuit breakers uh, on the market. Circuit, the, the market has been halted a number of times in the last couple of weeks. That's due to the market circuit breakers that are in place. She put together this little video which explains to you what they are, how they're implemented, and how you should think about it. So here is our segment on circuit breakers. On Monday, March 9th, trading was temporarily halted for the first time in over 20 years after a sell-off triggered an automatic trading curve, also known as a circuit breaker. Circuit breakers are regulatory measures meant to briefly pause trading on an exchange to limit sharp sell-offs. The idea behind them is that they allow traders to pause, take in information, and make decisions based on market conditions. Broad market indexes, such as the S&P 500, as well as individual stocks, have circuit breakers. They exist in the United States, as well as other countries. Wall Street's history is filled with panicked sell-offs, two of which were severe enough to earn the nickname Black Monday. In 1987, rocky trading, which began in Hong Kong and spread west to Europe, eventually rippled to the United States. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 508 points, or 22.6%. Regulators put the first circuit breakers in place following the crash of 1987 to avoid a violent single-day crash in the future. Ten years later, and for the first time, circuit breakers were triggered as the Dow fell 554 points, or 7.2%. Unfortunately, the circuit breakers were not tripped in the May 2010 flash crash when the Dow lost 1,000 points, or about 9%, in roughly 10 minutes. Prices mostly recovered by market close, but the failure of the post-1987 circuit breakers to halt the crash caused the Securities and Exchange Commission to update the circuit breaker system. The original circuit breakers after the 87 crash were previously linked to the 30-member Dow Jones Industrial Average with decline levels of 10%, 20%, and 30%. Since February 2013, we have had market-wide circuit breakers which respond to single-day declines in the S&P 500 index. These circuit breakers function automatically, stopping trading when prices hit predefined levels such as 7% for level 1, 13% for level 2, and 20% for level 3, all based on the intraday move for the S&P 500. 
The thresholds are set based on the closing price for the previous day. Level 1 and 2 declines stop trading for 15 minutes if the drop occurs before 3.25 p.m. If it's on or after 3.25 p.m., trading shall continue unless there is a level 3 halt. When a level 3 is tripped at any time during the trading day, trading shall halt for the remainder of the trading day. Level 2 and level 3 circuit breakers have yet to be triggered in their current form during regular trading hours between 9.30 a.m. and 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Similar rules apply to individual stocks, where circuit breaker trips are more common. One difference is, unlike their market-wide counterparts, these circuit breakers go off whether the price goes up or down. By monitoring gains and losses, it is the hope to address extraordinary market volatility. In a little over a week, circuit breakers have been triggered four times, causing market-wide halts, which in U.S. history is relatively uncommon, barring the exception of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, in which the New York Stock Exchange and other markets were closed for roughly a week. So that was our summary of the uh, circuit breakers and what they are, how they uh, get implemented. Kudos to, to Gretchen, our producer, for putting together a really, really well done video uh, explaining all of that. Uh, you know, it's funny, I've, I'm familiar with them and I've been aware of them for a while, but going through the process of, you know, helping her think about how to uh, put that story together uh, was, was actually really helpful. Just remind myself about about the history of those and how to think about them, to be honest with you. And, and you know, and in general, I mean, how do you think about them when they come along? Remember, the whole point of the trading halt is to, you know, take a breather, let things settle down, let things kind of come back together. And so that things open up in a little more orderly fashion. But when it's when it actually happens, usually things reopen to a bit of chaos. And usually when there's been a circuit breaker, when it opens again, there's a bit of a continuation, a bit of a continued sell off there. So I think more often than not, you know, be very wary when we get to those thresholds. When the market starts getting down five, six percent, um, be wary that there could get a point not far off where you may have to wait a little longer than normal to get filled at a certain level. So um, that's our special there. We're going to continue on to our next segment called Wrap the Week. And every Friday, we like to take a step back, try to look at the big picture. We actually asked uh, you guys a poll. Uh, and again, there's always a poll running on the Stock Charts TV window. So as you're watching our shows live, uh, you can answer the polls or at any point go to the Stock Charts TV page. You'll have a poll open there. We love to gather uh, some of your ideas because it helps us to think about how you all might be approaching this market and gives us ideas about how we can provide better programs, et cetera. And one of the, the things we just asked was about Apple. Um, will Apple make a new all-time high again this year? 69% of you said no. Over two-thirds, only one-third of you, about 31%, um, said yes. I did not vote in this poll. Um, but when I'm thinking about it, you know, the chances of Apple going back to a uh, to the 330 level, uh, boy, that seems like such a far way around from, away from now um, again. But the kicker is we're only in March. right? And I think that's the, the that's the challenge. When you think about how much the market has come down, two things come to mind with Apple. Number one, Apple has come down a lot less than everything else. You can see that this relative strength has been just consistently up and to the right. And I think that's one of the things that most impresses me about some of these big tech names and Apple's probably one of the better uh, examples. It's a big benchmark name for institutions. It's been up pretty consistently on a relative basis in uptrends or in downtrends. The XLK coincidentally looks very similar to that. If you look at the price and the relative, uh, relative movements, on a pure price basis, it certainly is in a valid downtrend and doesn't show any signs of alleviating that. But the relative strength has been pretty positive. But the question wasn't, do we think it's going to outperform? It was, is it going to return back up to the 330 level, that's 100 points away on Apple. If I had to pick, I'd probably say no. I, I doubt that the market would, it would take a V bottom or an accumulation of sorts that would really push things uh, back higher. And the market would have to recover enough for, Pete, for, for stocks like Apple, which are gonna outperform, to continue to be in that position of leadership. I don't know if I see all those things happening, but listen, I've been uh, plenty of times incorrect on those things. So you may, uh, you may be right, uh, yeses, but uh, but thanks so much for answering those questions. Let's wrap the week, continue uh, continue on with this process. What I like to do is look at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. Uh, if you don't, if you've not seen this, go to our articles page, go to the Mindful Investor, which is my page uh, on stock charts, and you'll see a little link to save the chart list to your own uh, login. And uh, you can actually have this on your own login to review. 
you know, the thing to remember with the market trend here as we're wrapping the week, and we've, we've, we've hit it a number of different ways this week so far, so I don't want to belabor it too much, but, you know, the trend has certainly come down. I think it's really interesting to note as of Friday's close, it has almost but not quite turned my very long-term trend following model negative. I, when, I, when I started talking about this a week ago, I picked up a little bit of heat because it didn't turn negative. And, and my response is it's not designed to turn negative that quickly. It's designed to be a tap the brakes mentality and only go negative when a downtrend is firmly in place with some staying power. And that requires some time in there. We just haven't had it yet. But boy, next week, if we continue a little bit further or even stay at these levels, I think you'll find uh, this triggering, uh, triggering a sell signal if it hasn't uh, already. The tactical side of this, and this is what I think is so important, has been negative and has remained even more so negative. And that was the first sort of warning, uh, warning signal for me. Second thing about wrapping week, the week that I would remind you is just the breadth picture. So, you know, I had some really good guests on here. My guest uh, yesterday, Cliff Droke, was talking about breadth, looking at new lows, talking about the capitulative nature of this extreme negative uh, breadth. I don't necessarily see it that way, although I value uh, Cliff in, in his point of view. Absolutely. I think he has some great points. Uh, but for me, I'm seeing the cumulative advanced decline tipping negative, and I'm not seeing great signs of that reversing. Until I see the cumulative advanced decline lines in any of these measures starting to turn upwards, showing that there's some accumulation, some better buying uh, out there in the markets, I think we just have to, to, to hold off. I don't, I don't think there's, uh, there's as much to, to get excited about, unfortunately. The final thing I'll remind you to wrap the week, and sorry we had a little less time than normal um, for it uh, today, but I would remind you to look at the scooter rankings. When I'm looking at the member dashboard looking down here, these are the day-to-day -day rankings. If you go to the full scooter reports, you can do the scooter changes week to week. And I love to look at that for industry groups and also look at that for stocks. And you'll find the things that are really fluctuating. It's all percentile based. So it's going to do a relative movement of all of those stocks. It's going to show you which stocks are still in a position of strength. And you can focus on some of the ones at the top of the scooter report list. I think it's very important to see something like Netflix, which is a big name that a lot of people are looking at, is one of the top 10 stocks as of Friday's close by their overall scooter rankings in the large cap space. The rest of these are all essentially sort of, besides Tiffany, which is more of a buyout name, the rest of these are all sort of in that, um, in that um, coronavirus trade. It's things like biotech, it's uh, staples, some semiconductors actually like AMD, but these are stocks that are actually holding up okay. It's a nice list to, uh, to look at and break down. We need to fo finish up the show folks by going right to the three and three. It's gonna be about the three and two, maybe one and a half but we're going to do it. So chart number one is the USO, the US oil fund. Uh, oil was down again today. It's been incredibly volatile. And again, the long-term history of oil, if you look at um, the oil uh, commodity on, on our platform, you can see it. USO is a great way to look at intraday movements in oil. And you can see that the USO was down 8% today. We'll have to see where crude oil uh, finished the week. Uh, but overall, certainly still in a position of weakness. And when I saw yesterday that big bounce, I heard people saying, oh, great, maybe oil is bottoming out. Do not get too excited about short-term movements like that. Remember, trends are made up of multiple days and multiple moves. Chart number two is looking at the breadth in the form of stocks above their 50 and 200-day moving average. I only point it here because when the, when the indicator got down to where it was in December 18, which was just below where it was in 2015 to 2016, I heard people getting a little excited thinking, okay, great, this is where things tend to bottom. But if you look, we have remained now below 10% for about a week plus. In this sort of environment, if you look back to the 2009 period or so, or 2008, 2009 period, you will see a similar thing where the indicator got below 10% and remained down there for an extended period of time for months, actually. I would argue that's sort of the environment we're in here. And the, the third of our thir three and three, is looking at growth versus value. A lot of people in the market gets beaten down. We start looking at value-oriented names, but I found with this ratio, it continues to be elevating, continues to increase, suggesting investors are leaning still more toward growth and value. We're in an interesting environment now where things like Apple and Microsoft continued more growth name or consider more growth names in this sort of methodology, and that those big cap tech stocks are where people are tending to go. That's why they're outperforming so well. So that ratio is still suggesting that the big cap growth trade is the place to be. It's not the time just yet to go into value or, or what it hasn't done is, uh, is value has not really materially improved anywhere, uh, anywhere in yet. So until you see an improvement in that ratio, it tells me to stick with growth. So ladies and gentlemen, that is our show and that's the week for the final bar. Boy, thanks for sticking with us through these weeks as we try to navigate this market, navigate social distancing, all the things that we're doing working remotely. Really appreciate our, our gift to provide ideas, provide context to you. 
For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great weekend. Be safe. Bye now.